Johnny, what about that, going in and using the old poltergeist bed? Any trepidations, fears about that? No, 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 not at all. I think it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful effect, first of all. You know, the whole room rotating and all that business is great. It's, you know, it's an unbelievable effect. What do you feel like when you're up there and they start pushing the buttons and that bed starts moving? What do you feel like? Well, you, uh, you feel fine, actually. I mean, it's, it's no big deal. Uh, I mean, the room is spinning. It's kind of a loss of equilibrium for a couple of minutes, but it's, it's no big deal. In another scene, um, the uh, character is lying on it, listening to his hi-fi, and uh, the killer, who exists only in the dreams of the characters, reaches up through the bed just as the character falls asleep and just snatches them downward. And this, this boy is listening to his hi-fi and watching television, and all this equipment, hi-fis and speakers and earphones and everything go racing down into the hole of the bed with him. And uh, shortly after this, uh, you know, all sorts of strange things start floating out of the bed, all being made possible through slow motion and turning this room on, on its uh, head, so to speak. Midnight. Baseball bats and boogeyman. Beautiful. Wes, in this particular film, what sort of things are you trying to get at? It's not, as I understand it, the same old horror type of film. No, it's not very much a, a very different kind of horror film. It's a much more of a dream, a, a, a dream film. Um, Cinema sort of is the media of dreams and illusions, and, and this very much goes into that using the um, sort of the naturalness of cinema for dream uh, events. It, it, it goes into uh, the dream states completely. It, it goes between dream states and waking states very much, and without really telling the, uh, the viewer or the audience when they are in which. So there's always a sort of the puzzle of where is this character now? Is she in a dream or is she in real life? Which is basically what the... Uh, the puzzle that she finds herself in uh, in the course of the story. This is just a dream. He isn't real. He isn't real. Are you attempting in this film to get away from the blood and gore? Yes, in, in a large extent, in, in the, uh, to the extent that there's not terrible deaths on, on screen happening to people. I mean, it is about a man who is a killer, but uh, there's, there's none of the big beheadings or things of that sort. It's much more sort of not supernatural, but strangely unnatural events happening to, uh, to this girl because much of what happens is, is in dreams. What about the poltergeist bed? How does that fit into this whole scheme of things? This is the Wes Craven bed. This, <laughs> well, twice in this movie we, um, we, we invert gravity. Um, we do a great deal of changing around time and space and gravity. And uh, twice in, uh, on this stage we have this revolving set that actually can do a 360 degree thing so that fluids can flow uphill, uh, characters can rise, uh, they can walk up walls, they can uh, fall from ceilings. Uh, uh, we have the ability to peop put people on the floor looking up to somebody else that's walking across the ceiling. So we can deal, it, as dreams do, with uh, things that are sort of in violation of gravity, in violation of time and space. So it's all part of disorienting people uh, as you are disorienting a dream. How does the revolving bed actually work? It actually works very well, <laughs> surprisingly to us. Um, uh, it works in two different ways. One is uh, there is a, a large column of fluid that, that flows sort of in slow motion out of it and, and spreads across the ceiling and then washes down one wall. In one scene, it is a sort of an engineering marvel uh, concocted by our special effects uh, maestro, Jim Doyle. And it actually is very finely tuned, and you can revolve it uh, with one man just pulling on a rope, and the whole thing revolves very much like uh, just a big uh, clockwork thing. It's uh, quite an amazing achievement. It's all counterbalanced, and all the cameras inside are locked down so that uh, when you watch the film that's shot uh, in the room, you have no illusion of the, film, of the room moving at all. It's just all of a sudden gravity reverses. And it becomes very, very strange. We understand that Fred Krueger has become a kind of a cult hero. What indications have you gotten of that? I only experienced it recently. I do uh, uh, public appearances and some science fiction conventions. He was very popular at the end of the autograph line. I looked back and there were some sort of heavy metal types and then behind them there were four or five people in complete Freddy uh, drag. 
as it were. Complete makeup. I don't know why anybody would want to go through that makeup if they didn't have to or weren't getting paid for it. But it was incredibly detailed. They'd somehow found the sweaters. They had the hats, the baggy pants, the old work boots. They had the claw hand on the gardening gloves with the fish knives for fingernails. Two of them were, were almost as good as ours. And I understand now that there's um, uh, like uh, midnight movies of Nightmare playing in some cities and people there go dressed as Fred Krueger. What do you attribute that to? I don't know, I think it's just, a, I think that Nightmare One's a great cheap thrill. You know, it's sort of like a, a sleazy e-ticket, you know, at Disneyland, and uh, I guess that's why. Uh, it wasn't a, a very expensive movie to make, but uh, you see all the money on the screen, you get your money's worth. Uh, the thrills are very evenly paced in that film. You, you're never, your heart never stops palpitating, you know. Let's talk just for a minute about the makeup process. Well, the mental thing is, while it's going on, helps me with the character. I, I'm in the makeup chair for three or three and a half hours, so I just look in that mirror and I slowly change. I get a lot of sympathy because of this makeup, and I sort of milk it a little bit. It's really not hard to wear at all. It's very, very light. There's several pieces, and the only part that's not, you know, uh, easy or a coast is actually getting it on and taking it off. The wearing is not bad at all. Now I haven't had to wear it outside in the daytime and because it seals up my entire head I'm sure I'd get pretty hot outside with the sun beating down on me but I'm inside on a sound stage or my exterior work has been at night so I haven't had any displeasure. You know, um, The actual process with the acting that helps though is just sitting there and uh, until he gets to my mouth I shoot the breeze with Kevin Yeager my makeup man and tease him and harass him. And it's just sort of, I sort of slowly become Fred, just looking at myself in the mirror. Please, God. This is God. 